Thank you. If, if, I, may, if I may make a unanimous consent to ask Mr. Goodlatte a question so that, we all, so that we all do understand the nature of the language that we will be reading today. So I would like to ask Mr. Goodlatte if he could explain... Without objection, the gentleman from Virginia may yield for that purpose. Thank you. Mr. Goodlatte, could you explain to us the decision-making process about which language to read sure. today? And the reason I ask is uh, through our American history, we've had a series of amendments that were intended to change the original document. But the amendments do not make specific deletions to specific language in the original document. And it's been up to us to ascertain the intent of the amendments to figure out which really language is operative or not. But the language has not specifically been deleted by the amendments. So it, it could be subject to some interpretation of which language really has been removed and which has not. And so I think it would be helpful to the members if you explain to us how the determinations of what to read has been made or not made so that we all be on the same page as to congressional intent. I thank the gentleman for his question. We have consulted with the Congressional Research Service of the Library of Congress. Uh, the Library of Congress actually maintains uh, a copy of the Constitution which includes those sections that have been uh, superseded by amendment. So we are not reading those sections that have been superseded by amendment and we have uh, arrived at that determination based upon our consultation with uh, the Congressional Research Service. And would the gentleman accept the premise that since we have not been able to review the exact language we will be reading today, there's that, that this is not, this is not, thank you gentlemen, but Mr. Goodlatte, I'll wait for a moment, Mr. Speaker, thank you. House will be in order. We do want to have a good bipartisan success here today, and this is a special moment for us all. So I guess the question is, um, I, I take it that the, since we've not had discussion about which language to read or not, that this is not intended to create any statement of congressional intent about the language, but rather to do our best to have a, a, a moment of comity to read the language as best as we can ascertain it. Is that correct? I think correct? the gentleman has stated that very well. Thank you, and I very much appreciate your leadership in bringing this to, to our attention today. Thank you, Brett. Gentleman from Virginia. Gentleman. What purpose does the gentleman from Illinois arise? I'd like to ask Mr. Goodlatte a parliamentary inquiry. A parliamentary gentleman inquiry. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me uh, first of all thank. Is the gentleman asking unanimous consent? Mr. Speaker, if I may ask unanimous consent to does address Does the gentleman Mr. from Goodlatt. Virginia yield for that purpose? I yield. The gentleman yields. I thank the gentleman for his kindness. Let me first begin by saying that I think every member of this body is approaching the reading uh, of their constitution with the most sacred possible spirit in what is clearly an unprecedented moment in the history of the Congress of the United States. And I don't take it very serious, I don't take it very lightly when my colleague or when others, before we begin the reading of our sacred document, are raising questions about uh, what we will specifically be reading, what specifically will be didacted based upon uh, amendments or based upon the recommendations of libraries of Congress. But I also want to be very clear Mr. Speaker and Mr. Goodlett, I recognize that this is a, a request that in reading those didacted, uh, this is very emotional for me, it's very emotional for I know a number of members, given the struggle, and I'm not trying to take a shot at the process, and Mr. Goodlett knows me, and he knows the spirit within which I'm approaching this, given the struggle of African Americans, given the struggle of women, given the strugg struggle of others to create a more perfect document, while not perfect, a more perfect document, to hear that those elements of the Constitution that have been didacted by amendment are no less serious, no less part of our ongoing struggle to improve the country and to make the country better, and our sense in our struggle in whom we are at the Congress of the United States at this point in American history, and our desire to continue to improve the Constitution Many of us don't want that to be lost upon uh, the reading of our, sacred, of our sacred document. And so with that said, uh, I thank the gentleman uh, for yielding, and I just wanted to uh, indicate that uh, this is done with sincerity. It is not done to take a shot at the idea of reading the Constitution, uh, but certainly when we were informed, for example, that the three-fifths clause would not be mentioned and that 
other elements of the Constitution which justify why some of us fight for programs in the Congress will not be written in the didactic version. It is of consequence to who we are. Thank you, Mr. I, Speaker. I thank the gentleman for his comments, and I take them very much to heart, as has our leadership. In fact, in recognition of the gentleman's concern, I mentioned in my comments that only two members would be recognized out of order to read sections. One is the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Smith, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, who will read the first article of Section 3 dealing with the judiciary. The other is the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Lewis, who many regard as the foremost advocate for civil rights in the Congress. He will read the 13th Amendment. Uh, and in that regard, uh, we hope to address the concern that you raised. Uh, gentleman, yield for just one moment. If, if Does the gentleman ask unanimous consent? Ask unanimous consent. Will the gentleman yield for that purpose? I yield. I yield. Without objection. Out of the same deference and respect for this document that we revere, I think it's important that we use the language of the Constitution itself. They are not deletions. They are amendments. And in that respect, we go by the amended document, not by the deleted document. There are too many that have fought and died for those amendments to call them deletions. With that, I yield back. It is an amended document, but we are going to read the document as amended. I thank the members of both parties in advance for their participation in this historic event. I thank the leadership and members for providing for this reading in the rules of the House. It is now my distinct honor to yield to the Speaker of the House to begin the reading. Uh, we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. I now yield to the minority leader, the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Pelosi. All Article 1, Section 1. All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and a House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. I now yield to the majority leader, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Cantor. Article 1, Section 2. The House of Representatives shall be composed of members chosen every second year by the people of the several states, and the electors in each state shall have the qualifications requisite for electors of the most numerous branch of the state legislature. No person shall be a representative who shall not have attained to the age of 25 years and been seven years a citizen of the United States, and who shall not when elected, be an inhabitant of that state in which he shall be chosen. The actual enumeration shall be made within three years after the first meeting of the Congress of the United States and within every subsequent term of ten years in such manner as they shall, be, as they shall by law direct. I now yield to the minority whip, the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Hoyer. Article 1, Continuation of Section 2. The number of representatives shall not exceed one for every 30,000, but each state shall have at least one representative. And until such enumeration shall be made, the state of New Hampshire shall be entitled to choose three, Massachusetts eight, Rhode Island and Providence Plantations one, Connecticut five, New York six, New Jersey four, Pennsylvania 8, Delaware 1, Maryland 6, Virginia 10, North Carolina 5, South Carolina 5, and Georgia 3. When vacancies happen in the representation from any state, the executive authority thereof shall issue writs of election to fill such vacancies. The House of Representatives shall choose their speaker and other officers and shall have the sole power of impeachment. 
I now yield to the gentleman from California, the Majority Whip, Mr. McCarthy. Article 1, Section 3. The Senate of the United States shall be composed of two senators from each state for six years, and each senator shall have one vote. Immediately after, they shall be assembled in consequence of the first election. They shall be divided as equally as may be into three classes. I now yield to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Rothman. I would ask members to read the page right in front of them and not continue. The seats of the senators of the first class shall be vacated at the expiration of the second year, of the second class at the expiration of the fourth year, and of the third class at the expiration of the sixth year, so that one-third may be chosen every second year. I now yield to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Conway. No person shall be a senator who shall not have attained to the age of 30 years and have been nine years a citizen of the United States and who shall not, when elected, be an inhabitant of that state for which he shall be chosen. I now yield to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott. The Vice President of the United States shall be President of the Senate, but shall not have no vote unless they be equally divided. The Senate shall choose their other officers and also a President pro tempore. In the absence of the Vice President, or when he shall exercise the office of President of the United States. And you'll now yield to the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg. The Senate shall have the sole power to try all impeachments. When sitting for that purpose, they shall be on oath or affirmation. When the President of the United States is tried, the Chief Justice shall preside, and no person shall be convicted without the concurrence of two-thirds of the members present. I now yield to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kreitz. Judgment in cases of impeachment shall not extend further than to removal from office and disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States. But the party convicted shall nevertheless be liable and subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment according to law. I now yield to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Pope. Section 4. The times, places, and manner of the holding of elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof. But the Congress may at any time, by law, make or alter such regulations except as to the places of choosing senators. I now yield the gentleman from New York, Mr. Weiner. Section 5. Each House shall be the judge of the elections, returns, and qualification of its own members, and a majority of each shall constitute a quorum to do business. But a smaller number may adjourn from day to day, and may be authorized to compel the attendance of absent members in such manner and under such penalties as each House may provide. I now yield to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Woodall. Each House may determine the rules of its proceedings, punish its members for disorderly behavior, and with the concurrence of two-thirds, expel a member. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Maryland, Ms. Edwards. Each House shall keep a journal of its proceedings and from time to time publish the same excepting such parts as may in their judgment require secrecy. 
and the yeas and nays of the members of either house on any question shall, at the discretion of one-fifth of those present, be entered on the journal. I now yield to the, yield to the gentlewoman from Michigan, Ms. Miller. Neither House, during the session of Congress, shall, without the consent of the other, adjourn for more than three days, nor to any other place than that in which the two Houses shall be sitting. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. Section 6, the Senators and Representatives shall receive a compensation for their services to be ascertained by law and paid out of the Treasury of the United States. They shall, in all cases, except treason, felony, and breach of the peace, be privileged from arrest during their attendance at the session of their respective houses and in going to and returning from the same. And for any speech or debate in either house, they shall not be questioned in any other place. Now yield to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Pitts. No senator or representative shall, during the time for which he was elected, be appointed to any civil office under the authority of the United States, which shall have been created, or the emoluments whereof shall have been increased during such time, and no person holding any office under the United States shall be a member of either House during his continuance in office. I now yield to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pascrell. Section 7. All bills for raising revenue shall originate in the House of Representatives, but the Senate may propose or concur with amendments as on other bills. Now yield to the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Wilson. Every bill which shall have passed the House of Representatives and the Senate shall, before it become a law, be presented to the President of the United States. If he approve, he shall sign it but if not, he shall return it, with his objections to that house in which it shall have originated, which shall enter the objections at large on their journal, and proceed to reconsider it. My apologies. I now yield to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green. Every bill which shall have passed the House of Representatives and the Senate shall before it be <laughs> If after such consideration two-thirds of the House shall agree to pass the bill, it shall be sent together with the objections to the other House, by which it shall likewise be reconsidered. And if approved by two-thirds of that House, it shall become a law. I thank the gentleman. I now recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy. But in all such cases, the votes of both houses shall be determined by yeas and nays, and the names of the persons voting for and against the bill shall be entered on the journal of each house, respectively. I now yield to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Davis. If any such bill shall not be returned by the President within 10 days, Sundays excepted, after it shall have been presented to him, the same shall be a law, in like manner as if he had signed it, unless the Congress by their adjournment prevent its return, in which case it shall not be a law. I now yield to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Lobiondo.
Every order, resolution, or vote to which the concurrence of the Senate and the House of Representatives may be necessary, except on a question of adjournment, shall be presented to the President of the United States, and before the same shall take effect, shall be approved by him, or being disapproved by him, shall be repassed by two-thirds of the Senate and House of Representatives according to the rules and limitations prescribed in the case of a bill. I now yield to the gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Langevin. Section 8. The Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excise to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. But all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. I now yield to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Lance. To borrow money on the credit of the United States to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes, to establish a uniform rule of naturalization and uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcies throughout the United States. I now yield to the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Kildee. To coin money, regulate the value thereof and of foreign coin, and fix the standards of weights and measures to provide for the punishment of counterfeiting the securities and current coin of the United States to establish post offices and post roads. I now yield to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Henserlin. To promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. I now yield to the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Inslee. to constitute tribunals inferior to the Supreme Court, to define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas and offenses against the law of nations. I now yield to the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Duncan. To declare war grant letters of marquee and reprisal, and make rules concerning captures on land and water, to raise and support armies, but no appropriation of money to that use shall be for a longer term than two years. I now yield to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Holt. To provide and maintain a navy, to make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces, to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. I now yield to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Canseco. To provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia, and for governing such part of them as may be employed in the service of the United States, reserving to the states respectfully the appointment of the officers and the authority of training the militia according to the discipline prescribed by Congress. I now yield to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Scott. Hmm. 
to exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over such district not exceeding 10 miles square as may by succession of particular states and the exception and the acceptance of Congress become the seat of government of the United States and to exercise like authority over all places purchased by the consent of the legislature of the state in which the same shall be for the erection of forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings. I now yield to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. West. And to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or office thereof. I now yield to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Keating. Section 9. The migration or importation of such persons as any of the estates now existing shall think proper to admit, shall not be prohibited by the Congress prior to the year 1808, but a tax or duty may be imposed on such importation not exceeding $10 for each person. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Tennessee, Ms. Black. The privilege of writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion the public safety may require it. No bill of attainer or ex post facto law shall be passed. I now yield to the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Perlmutter. No capitation or other direct tax shall be laid unless in proportion to the census or enumeration herein before directed to be taken. No tax or duty shall be laid on articles exported from any state. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Washington, Ms. McMorris Rogers. No preference shall be given by any regulation of commerce or revenue to the ports of one state over those of another, nor shall vessels bound to or from one state be obligated to enter, clear, or pay duties to another. Now yield to the gentleman from California, Mr. Honda. No money shall be drawn from the Treasury, but in consequence of appropriations made by law, in a regular statement and account of the receipts and expenditures of all, public money shall be published from time to time. Now I yield to the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Gardner. No title of nobility shall be granted by the United States, and no person holding any office or profit or trust under them shall without the consent of the Congress accept of any present emolument, office, or title of any kind whatever from any king, prince, or foreign state. I now yield to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Loretta Sanchez. No state shall enter in, into any treaty, alliance, or consideration, grant letters of marquee and reprisal, coin money, emit bills of credit, make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts, pass any bill of a tender ex post facto law, or law impairing the obligation of contracts, or grant any title of nobility. I now yield to the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Pompeo.
no state shall, without the consent of the Congress, lay any imposts or duties on imports or exports except what may be absolutely necessary for executing its inspection laws. And the net produce of all duties and imposts laid by any state on imports or exports shall be for the use of the Treasury of the United States, and all such laws shall be subject to the revision and control of the Congress. I now yield to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Rangel. No state shall, without the consent of Congress, lay any duty of tonnage, keep troops, or ships of war in time of peace, enter into any agreement or compact with another state or with a foreign power, or engage in war unless actually invaded or in such eminent danger as will not admit to delay. I now yield to the gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Hayworth. Article 2, Section 1. The executive power shall be vested in a President of the United States of America. He shall hold his office during a term of four years and, together with the Vice President, chosen for the same term, be elected as follows. I now yield to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Payne. Each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature therefore may direct a number of electors equal to the whole number of senators and representatives to which the state may be entitled in the Congress, but no senator or representative or person holding an office of trust or profit under the United States shall be appointed an elector. I now yield to the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Young. The Congress may determine the time of choosing the electors and the day on which they shall give their votes which day shall be the same throughout the United States. I now yield to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pallone. No person except a natural born citizen or a citizen of the United States at the time of the adoption of this Constitution shall be eligible to be the office of President. Neither shall The chair would remind persons in the gallery, the chair would remind all persons in the gallery that they are here as guests of the House and that any manifestation of approval or disapproval of the proceedings is a violation of the rules of the House. The chair notes a disturbance in the gallery in contravention of the law and rules of the House. The sergeant at arms will remove those persons responsible for the disturbance and restore order in the gallery. Gentleman from Virginia. Gentleman from New Jersey. Neither shall any person be eligible to that office who shall not have attained to the age of 35 years and been 14 years a resident within the United States. I now yield to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith. The President shall at stated times receive for his services a compensation which shall neither be increased nor diminished during the period for which he shall have been elected and he shall not receive within that period any other emolument from the United States or any of them. Now yield to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Richardson. Before he enter on the execution of his office, he shall take the following oath or affirmation. I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will faithfully execute the office of the President of the United States and will to the best of my ability preserve, protect, and defend 
the Constitution of the United States. I now yield to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Latta. Section 2. The President shall be Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States and of the militia of the several states when called in actual service of the United States. He may require the opinion in writing of the principal officer in each of the executive departments upon any subject relating to the duties of the respective offices, and he shall have the power to grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States except in cases of impeachment. I now yield to the gentleman from, New from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. He shall have power by and with the advice and consent of the Senate to make treaties provided two-thirds of the senators present concur. And he shall nominate and by and with the advice and consent of the Senate shall appoint ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, judges of the Supreme Court, and all other officers of the United States whose appointments are not herein otherwise provided for and which shall be established by law. I now yield to the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Cassidy. But the Congress may by law vest the appointment of such inferior officers as they think proper in the President alone in the courts of law or in the heads of departments. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Colorado, Ms. DeGette. The President shall have power to fill up all vacancies that may happen during the recess of the Senate by granting commissions which shall expire at the end of the next session. I now yield to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Johnson. Section 3, he shall from time to time give the Congress information of the State of the Union and recommend to their consideration such measures as he shall judge necessary and expedient. He may, on extraordinary occasions, convene both houses or either of them, and in case of disagreement, between them. I now yield to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. With respect to the time of adjournment, he may adjourn them to such time as he shall think proper. He shall receive ambassadors and other public ministers. He shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed and shall commission all the officers of the United States. I now yield to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Shabbat. The President, Vice President, and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. I now yield to the gentleman from, from Texas, Mr. Smith, the Chairman of the Judiciary Committee. The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. The judges, both of the Supreme and inferior courts, shall hold their offices during good behavior and shall at stated times receive for their services a compensation which shall not be diminished during their continuance in office. I now yield to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Bishop.
Section 2. The judicial power shall extend to all cases in law and equity arising under this Constitution, the laws of the United States, and treaties made, or which shall be made under their authority, to all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers, and consuls, to all cases of admiralty and maritime jurisdiction. I now yield to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Farenthold. To controversies to which these United States shall be a party, to controversies between two or more states, between the citizens of different states, between the citizens of the same, the same state claiming lands under grants of different states, and between a state or the citizens thereof, and foreign states, and citizens or subjects. Now yield to the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Donnelly. In all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, and those in which a state shall be party, the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. In all the other cases before mentioned, the Supreme Court shall have appellate jurisdiction, both as to law and fact, with such exceptions and under such regulations as the Congress shall make. And now I yield to the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Pierce. The trial of all crimes, except in cases of impeachment, shall be by jury, and such trial shall be held in the state where the said crimes shall have been committed, but not when committed within any state. The trial shall be at such place or places as the Congress may be may by law have directed. I now yield to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Altmeyer. Treason against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. No person shall be convicted of treason unless on the testimony of two witnesses to the same overt act or on confession in an open court. I now yield to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Turner. The Congress shall have the power to declare the punishment of treason, but to no attainder of treason shall work corruption of blood or forfeiture except during the life of the person attained. I now yield to the gentleman from Delaware, Mr. Carney. Article 4, Section 1. Full faith and credit shall be given in each state to the public acts, records, and judicial proceedings of every other state. And the Congress may by general laws prescribe the manner in which such acts, records, and proceedings shall be proved and the effect thereof. I now yield to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Harris. Section 2. The citizens of each state shall be entitled to all privileges and immunities of citizens in the several states. Now yield to the gentleman from California, Mr. Schiff. A person charged in any state with treason, felony, or other crime who shall flee from justice and be found in another state shall on demand of the executive authority of the state from which he fled be delivered up to be removed to the state having jurisdiction of the crime. I now yield to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Gibbs. Section 3, new states may be admitted by the Congress into this union, but no new state shall be formed or erected within the jurisdiction of any other state, nor any state be formed by the junction of the two or more states, 
or parts of states without the consent of the legislatures of the states concerned as well as for the Congress. Now I yield to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Nadler. The Congress shall have power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory or other property belonging to the United States. And nothing in this Constitution shall be so construed as to prejudice any claims of the United States or of any particular state. I now yield to the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Fortenberry. Or by conventions in three-fourths thereof, as the one or the other mode of ratification may be proposed by the Congress, provided that no amendment which may, may be made prior to the year 1,808 shall in any manner affect the first and fourth clauses in the ninth section of the first article, and that no state without its consent shall be deprived of its equal suffrage in the Senate. I now yield to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Matsui. Article 6. All debts contracted and engagements entered into before the adoption of this Constitution shall be as valid against the United States under this Constitution as under the Confederation. I now yield to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Garrett. This Constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof and all the treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. Any things in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. I now yield to the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. The senators and representatives before mentioned and the members of the several state legislature and all executive and judicial officers, both of the United States and of the several states, shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support this Constitution, but no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. Now I yield to the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Lamborn. The ratification of the conventions of nine states shall be sufficient for the establishment of this Constitution between the states so ratifying the same. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Hawaii, Ms. Hirono. The word the being interlined between the seventh and eighth lines of the first page, the word 30 being partly written on an erasure in the 15th line of the first page, the words is tried being interlined between the 32nd and 33rd lines of the first page, and the word the being interlined between the 43rd and the 44th lines of the second page. I now yield to the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Tipton. Dunning Convention, by unanimous consent of the states, present the seventh, 17th day of September in the year of our Lord, 1787 and of the independence of the United States of America, the twelfth in witness whereof we have hereunto subscribed our names.
I now recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Carnahan. Signers of the Constitution, George Washington, President and Deputy from Virginia, Delaware, George Reed, Gunning Bedford, John Dickinson, Richard Bassett, Jacob Broom, Maryland, James McHenry, Daniel of St. Thomas Jennifer, Daniel Carroll, Virginia, John Blair, James Madison, Jr. I now yield to the gentleman from California, Mr. McClintock. From the state of North Carolina, William Blount, Richard Dobbs Spate, Hugh Williamson. From South Carolina, John Rutledge, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, Charles Pinckney, Pierce Butler. From Georgia, William Few, Abraham Baldwin. Now yield to the gentleman from Washington, Mr. McDermott. New Hampshire, John Langdon, Nicholas Gilman, Massachusetts, Nathaniel Gorham, Rufus King, Connecticut, William Samuel Johnson, Roger Sherman, New York, Alexander Hamilton. Now I yield to the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Yoder. New Jersey, William Livingston, David Brerley, William Patterson, Jonathan Dayton. From Pennsylvania, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Mifflin, Robert Morris, George Clymer, Thomas Fitzsimmons, Jared Ingersoll, James Wilson, and Governor Morris. I now yield to the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Levin. Preamble to the Bill of Rights. Congress of the United States, begun and held at the City of New York on Wednesday, the 4th of March, 1789. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Alabama, Ms. Roby. The conventions of a number of the states having at the time of their adopting the Constitution expressed a desire in order to prevent misconstruction or abuse of its powers that further declaratory and restrictive clauses should be added and as extending the ground of public confidence in the government will best ensure the beneficent ends of its institution. I now yield to the gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Ross. Resolved by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America and Congress assembled, two-thirds of both houses concurring, that the following articles be proposed to the legislatures of the several states as amendments to the Constitution of the United States. I now yield to the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Bonner. All or any which articles, when ratified by three-fourths of the said legislatures, to be valid to all intents and purposes as part of the said Constitution. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Hawaii, Ms. Hanabusa.
Articles in addition to an amendment of the Constitution of the United States of America proposed by Congress and ratified by the legislatures of the several states pursuant to the fifth article of the original Constitution. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Arizona, Ms. Giffords. The First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. I now yield to the gentleman from New Hampshire, Mr. Ginta. The Second Amendment, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. I now yield to the gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman. The Third Amendment, no soldier shall in time of peace be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. I now yield to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gomert. Amendment 4. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Now yield to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch. The Fifth Amendment. No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia, when in actual service in time of war or public danger. Now you go to the gentleman from California, Mr. Denham. I now yield to the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Franks. Nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be put twice in jeopardy of life or limb nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. I now yield to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Speer. The Sixth Amendment. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law. I now yield to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Westmoreland.
and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process for the obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. Now I yield to the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Lipinski. Uh, 